Good morning, everyone. Michael the Maven. And in today's episode of the Maven Nation Photography Podcast, I'm going to tackle a very difficult topic. How fanboyism is the cancer of the photography community on YouTube. First, let me say thank you to our sponsor, Proven Nutrition. They make an awesome energy drink called Core Fit. I drink it. I love it. I've been using it for about a year and a half. I've lost 40 pounds. It is a great pre and post workout energy drink. It has everything you need. I no longer drink whey protein because of it. Proven Nutrition has agreed to send you a free sample if you cover shipping and handling. That link is in the description. So what is a fanboy? To me, the definition, a good one at least, is blind devotion. It is a high degree of subjectivity. So what is subjectivity? Subjectivity is personal preference. It is biased. It's usually based more on feelings or the perception of the individual in their mind that does not apply to the external world. So it's a, it's a taste that you have. Preferences are good. They are normal and they are natural. The trick is knowing when to challenge those preferences in order to be something called objective. Objectivity deals more with things that you can measure. Facts, it's impartial, it's unbiased. It's something that you can point out as empirically true. The moon exists. That would be a good example of an objective observation. It's a fact. We can scientifically measure that the moon exists whether it's pretty or not really depends on your personal tastes. So what happens is when I read the comments on a photography or a camera review or video, I see comments going back and forth that violate so many rules of debate that if I simply make you aware of what's happening, many of you will take this to heart and probably change how you interact with others when it comes to debating. Opinions are fine. There's nothing wrong with opinions. I love pepperoni pizza. I love 72% dark chocolate. I love ice cream. I love college football. There's nothing that anyone can do by presenting facts that is going to change my mind about those things. So if you like a Canon camera, it's undebatable. So the first point I'm trying to make about fanboyism is that opinions are fine, but debating them is a complete waste of time. You are never going to be able to empirically convince somebody that they do not like something or that they do like something that they don't. And this is what's happening half of the time in the YouTube comments. If this is the one thing you pull away from this video, you are going to be a better person from it. You cannot debate opinion. It's okay to have opinions. It's okay to have preferences but you cannot mathematically debate them. And when somebody starts debating opinion with you, just walk away from it. Now, having said all that, I also believe that what is right is far greater than who is right. Now, there are some YouTube channels, I'm not gonna name any names, but they teach the who is wrong concept. And this philosophy is less effective. It's gonna make you a worse person if you think who is wrong is more important than what is right. Let me give you an example. I do a lot of disaster aid work. We'll be in situations where people are literally starving. And in some cases, lives have been on the line. And if you get into a debate with your team members about problem solving and you become obsessed with who is wrong, you will never solve the problem. If you're able to take your ego and put it in the back seat and ask the question, what will resolve this concern, you will be far more effective, far more productive, and you will not waste time on these meaningless arguments on the internet. So I remember sometimes, you know, we're in a discussion and somebody will have an idea and it's shot down and they take it personally. And you really just got to ignore that because the one guy who never speaks up, he finally says something. And when you have open-mindedness to the fact that your idea may not be the best one, you can listen to him and everybody will say, he's this is the solution that we've been looking for. Your ego and who is right is secondary to the truth. And so I like to refer to people as truth seekers when they are able to do this. When it comes to problem solving, such as doing a specific shoot, the tools for the job become more important. So a couple years ago, I was hired to be the cinematographer for a movie. The director had some requirements. The colorist had some requirements. And in talking with both of them, I quickly realized that the cameras that I owned were not enough to get the job done. He wanted 10-bit 422, the colorist. 
didn't have anything that could do 4-bit 2.2 at the time. So I did some research and I decided to go with a Canon C300 Mark II. And we shot most of the movie with that. But there were several times during the shoot where we needed a specific camera with specific performance features to solve a problem. And had I not had the flexibility to say, you know what, we're going to shoot this on an iPhone or we're going to shoot this on an A7R2 because of its tracking on a gimbal, I wouldn't have been able to been as effective as I was on the shoot. And this is something that for years I fought. I was a die hard Canon user for probably the first eight or nine years of my career. And then I started teaching and I named my, my training video canontrainingvideo.com because I wouldn't, I would never think of shooting with another brand, heaven forbid, right? So what happened was over the years, Nikon users were, hey, where's a training video on this? And I'm, I, no, Nikon, ugh, ugh, I don't, yeah, you know? How dare Nikon exist and breathe the same air as me? Long story short, I decided, okay, I'll buy the lowest end Nikon camera, the D3200, and I'll make a training video on it. So we took it out, did some test shots, and lo and behold, the dynamic range for landscape shots was far superior than anything I had seen on any Canon camera, let alone full frame. This was APS-C, smaller sensor. To me, that empirical data, the factual proof that the dynamic range was better made me feel like I had been sleeping for eight years. I had no idea the dynamic range was that good. It wasn't a, an attack on a person. It was an empirical fact that can be measured. And it really opened my mind to this concept that cameras are tools. And this is another fallacy. No one camera is better than all other cameras in everything. Every single camera that I have ever used or met has weaknesses. And we, we have videos from YouTubers and reviews that it's all positive. And when I hear the all positive reviews, I, I, I feel like I'm missing where are the weaknesses. And so that's something I try to do on my channel is let's talk about the factual weaknesses. I, I made a video about uh, Sony's weaknesses. Here are 14 weaknesses that Sony ha has. Read the comments. A lot of people very upset with that. Again, and there's a reason for this that I'll come back to in a second. But what I'm saying is when I read your comments, it, it sounds to me like you're arguing about tools when you're often both right. It's like saying Phillips head screwdrivers are better for Phillips head screws and somebody will say, no, you're an idiot. Hammers are better for hitting nails. And, it's, and like I'm reading some of these and I'm like, you're both right. You're talking about the strengths for both of them for a particular task. So Olympus came out with their latest flagship, the M1X, and people started attacking it right away. Olympus is not trying to be the do-it-all one camera. That camera is a niche camera for sports shooters, outdoor and wildlife. They're trying to put a compact solution with seven steps of image stabilization. That is a very specific tool. It's not meant to be a low light portrait camera. That's not even what it's designed for. Olympus gets this. They're embracing a tool for the job. So if you're able to look at cameras as tools, strip off the brand name, and if I was to hand you two pieces of paper with the specifications that actually perform that way, and you had a sporting event to go shoot, and I said, hey, this one's 10 frames per second with 88% accuracy, this one's two to three frames per second with 50% accuracy, I guarantee all of you would choose the higher frames per second camera with a greater accuracy and say this one's no go. The second we say this is a Canon EOS R and this is an A7 III, then the choices start to change. All of a sudden, the Canon's a little bit better and this is what camera companies want from you. They want you to be blindly devout so every time they come out with a new product, you're gonna buy it without thinking. What I'm suggesting is they have strengths and weaknesses. Look at them at tools. Let me help you, and there's a lot of other great YouTubers out there that will help you as well. Let me show you what it's good for, let me show you what it's bad for, and become a little bit more objective in your decision-making process. So a couple other ideas I wanna share with you is that nobody is correct 100% of the time. It's impossible. And especially in the camera world when we're making these vid videos that are technically difficult, there's concepts, there's physics, it's very easy for people to make a mistake. And so when you see somebody making a mistake, it is very easy to latch onto that mistake and throw out the other 95% of what they are saying is correct. 
And so I've done this. This has happened many times. You're going to encounter it. You're going to disagree with somebody. The truth of the matter is, it is to your advantage to at least try to understand where they are coming from based on the facts, not opinions. What facts are supporting what they are saying? And every time I've done that, I have learned something. Another problem with this fanboyism on YouTube is that it is very easy to intentionally misunderstand somebody. It's so easy to do this. I'm guilty of it. It's basically when somebody gives you a truth that you can think of the one instance where it's not true and you dish it back in their face, okay? So that is not going to get you anywhere. If you told me two plus two is four, and I wanted to intentionally misunderstand you, I would say something like, well, if you take two cats and you add two mice, the cats are gonna eat the mice, two plus two is actually two. You see how easy that is to misunderstand somebody? To understand somebody you disagree with, that takes some work. It takes some humility, and it also is going to be more beneficial to you because you may learn something you hadn't before. So when I started getting into my epic shootouts, we decided to do this huge epic shootout on the Sony a7S against the GH4. It's still on my feed, you can check it out. And one of the comments that I got was about my audio quality. The, the guy said, your audio quality sucks. And I was like, you know, I was like shocked. I was like, there's no way the audio, the audio sucks. We spent six weeks, thousands of dollars producing that video. We wanted it to be a really great production, almost like a TV show. I've listened to that audio 50 times. It was amazing. We cleaned it up. And he's like, nope, it sucks. <laughs> and so I was like, what is going on here? But for some reason, because he was talking about a measurable fact, your audio quality is poor, not so much a personal attack, Michael the Maven, you suck. He was saying your audio sucks. So I was, I, I was like, okay, we're gonna just in this case, assume he has a relevant point. And I went back and I listened to that audio and I heard it. It was the first time I had ever heard this level of audio frequency that I had never been aware of. He wasn't talking about the audio when I wasn't talking. He was talking about the scratching sound that he could hear when you know I was being audible. You could hear it. You can go back and listen to it now. It's like somebody scratching on it. I had never heard it before and he was right. And I became a better YouTuber because I was willing to, to look at the empirical facts, not a personal attack, this person was telling me. And so every time I hear that, that audio mistake now, it's like nails on a chalkboard. I can hear it very easily, whereas other people cannot. So this brings me to another story that when I, was, I played football at BYU, I was a walk-on for five years, and I learned something about failure is that I could have a great game personally. In terms of my responsibilities, and my, I could have the game of my life, but if we lost the game as a team, my coaches would tear me to pieces and they'd give me all this feedback about the things I had done wrong and how I could improve. And then I could have a terrible game making all kinds of mistakes, but if the team won, all was forgiven. Nobody talked about it. There was no feedback. There was no, hey, this is something you can improve on. It was like, hey, we did it, great and I wasn't getting that feedback. And so what I learned about failure, failure is your friend. It's a very difficult pill to swallow. As humans, we want to be comfortable. Our ego doesn't want to be wrong. We, we, you know, we want to feel good about ourselves, but there is not nearly as much room for growth in success as there is in failure. What I'm telling you is, not only should you give yourself permission to fail, you should seek to fail in order to glean the lessons learned. And the reason why I'm saying this is because you're likely a fanboy in something and you will not be able to learn from those opportunities of failure in your fanboyism unless you could recognize that you, you, felt, you fell short and there's something you can improve in. There is tremendous gold and opportunity in failing. It is the proof that you can improve, not success. So the last story I wanna, I wanna give you guys, and probably one of the most important lessons in terms of psychology, my own self-deception that I learned was in high school. My brother and I, we had just been given permission from our parents to start dating, you know, 17, something like that, 16 or 17, and we bought a book on how to date, how to date women, follow these rules, you'll be successful. And we learned something really fascinating. 
when Aaron, my brother, had a problem with a girl he was dating, he would come and talk to me and he would say, this is what's happening. And I would be like, dude, it is on page 36 of this book. He says it right here. Here's the answer. He's like, oh my gosh, you're right. If I was having a problem with a girl, I'd go to Aaron and I would talk to him and he's like, Mike, what's wrong? It's on page 54. He says it right here. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. And this went on for a little while, but we learned a very important and valuable truth in regards to fanboyism, subjectivity, and this is it. When you are financially or emotionally invested into anything, be it a person or a camera, you are going to have an emotional wrapper around your mind that is going to cloud your judgment. You are going to be blind from it because you are, you're unwilling to face the possibility that you might lose something that you've invested in. That's what's happening with these fanboyism comments is, is that we save all our money, we buy a camera, or we love it, we shoot with it, we're invested into it, and we become blind to the flaws of that piece of equipment. That is, that's a great secret that I've learned, is this emotional wrapper. As soon as I become financially or emotionally invested into something, I assume my judgment will be clouded, and I try to find a third party who is an expert in the topic that I can consult with, because why? Aaron didn't care about the girls I was dating. I didn't care about the girls that he was dating, and there were times I told him, dude, you gotta dump her right away. And he didn't like that at first. But looking at the facts, you know, this girl wasn't interested, she was playing him. And in the end, that's what I'm trying to do with my YouTube channel. I am not personally or emotionally or financially invested in what you are doing with your own camera purchases. I can shoot straight with you. I can tell you here are some strengths, here are some weaknesses. This is what I would do. And I hope that I've become your go-to person for this objective third-party window when your judgment is emotionally clouded. I wanna give you guys a couple exercises to consider that will hopefully crack the shell of subjectivity because we're all subjective. I do these same exercises. They have helped me tremendously. The first, I want you to write down on a piece of paper how often you are right about everything in general, all topics, everything. It, are you right 70% of the time, 80% of the time, 90, 95% of the time? Just write that down for a second. The second part of this exercise is I want you to think of a person that you dislike. If you hate somebody, you can write down the name of the person that you hate. Go ahead and write it down. And next to that person, I want you to write down five things that you admire about them. If you cannot do it, you are highly subjective minded. If you can find five things that you admire about the person, now we're getting into the world of looking at strengths and weaknesses. Third part of the exercise I want you to do is to write down your greatest failure and tell yourself three things that you learned from it. If you're able to do this, you are able, you're going to be able to use failures to your advantage. Now coming back to that first question, how often are you right or wrong? If your number is anything over probably 55%, you're lying to yourself. And the reason is if you're in the 60 or higher percent range, you could statistically go to Las Vegas and become a millionaire within uh, probably a day or two, okay? Vegas is set up so you're often wrong. And that's the truth, is if you consider the fact that you are going to be wrong probably 50% of the time or less, you're going to be far more open-minded to accepting this truth and becoming better. So that is my episode for you, for you today on fanboyism. Don't argue opinions. Don't assume one camera can do it all. Try not to intentionally misunderstand what somebody's saying. Try to understand where they're coming from. Be nice. Look at it as an opportunity to grow. Cameras are tools with strengths and weaknesses. So I know that was a long episode. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Thank you to our sponsor, Proven Nutrition. Try out Corfit. It's an amazing drink. Download the Maven Nation podcast from Stitcher or the Apple iTunes store. I would love to hear your comments below. Thank you guys for watching. Check out some of my training products and I will see you next time.